A very good morning to all of you. Uh, today we are going to discuss about uh, the hypertensive disorders that we see in pregnancy. The four major hypertensive disorders that occur, uh, that we see in pregnant women uh, uh, coming to us are preeclampsia and the related disorders, uh, which are eclampsia and HELP syndrome, gestational hypertension, chronic hypertension, and preeclampsia superimposed on a female who was already having chronic hypertension. So basically in this talk, we will cover in detail uh, the pathogenesis, clinical features, uh, diagnosis and management of preeclampsia and the related disorders. Uh, the rest three almost have similar and overlapping pathogenesis and similar management. Preeclampsia, how do we define it? any new onset of systolic blood pressure more than 140 and diastolic blood pressure more than 90 on at least two occasions uh, which we have measured at least four hours apart or uh, a systolic blood pressure more than 160 uh, systolic and a diastolic more than 110 even at one occasion is significant which is there along with a protein proteinuria more than 300 milligram over a 24 hour sample or a protein creatinine ratio more than 0.3 and or your urine dipstick reading is giving 2 plus this stands uh, this is the definition of uh, preeclampsia but uh, if even if the patient doesn't have proteinuria and has other uh, clinical severe features we can still define it as preeclampsia there is another entity called severe preeclampsia or preeclampsia with severe features which will include patients who have higher blood pressure readings of 160 by 110 on two occasions uh, measured uh, four hours apart and even one uh, reading is significant so you have to monitor these patients more uh, frequently along with a thrombocytopenia and uh, showing a platelet count less than one lakh having impaired liver function indicated by a increased liver transaminase le level more than twice the normal upper uh, normal value or a severe persistent right upper quadrant or epigastric pain which is not responding to your usual analgesics and is not accounted for by any other alternate diagnosis or the patient is having progressive renal insufficiency and a pregnant patient having uh, a creatinine more than 1.1 or doubling of her normal serum creatinine value in the absence of any other renal disease. Or the patient is having pulmonary edema or has persistent cerebral or visual disturbances. Uh, so basically, uh, the high BP readings, the systolic and blood pressure readings more than 160 by 110 along with involvement of your uh, other organs indicating some end organ damage and involvement which is involving the CNS and uh, uh, symptoms showing in terms of uh, new onset cerebral or visual disturbance, photo photopsia cortical blindness, retinal vasospasms, there are severe headaches which are not responding to your usual medication, uh, or liver involvement, liver abnormalities, as, as I mentioned before, thrombocytopenia, renal insufficiency, and cardiac involvement. So all these organ involvement along with the high blood pressure readings are basically how we diagnose the uh, case with severe preeclampsia. And uh, as you see, the diagnosis is mainly clinical pathogenesis of preeclampsia. Uh, so pathogenesis of preeclampsia has not been uh, understood properly yet, uh, but there are several theories out of which uh, the most important theory is uh, about the abnormal development of the placenta, which starts in the second trimester of the pregnancy, much before the symptoms manifest. Uh, what happens in a normal uh, placenta while it's growing uh, these, uh, as you see, you can see in the figure, uh, there are arcuate arteries, radial arteries, basal arteries, and coil arteries, and together they form a dense network of vessels uh, which penetrate from the placenta into the uh, um, uh, uterus of the mother to get adequate oxygenation and perfusion for the baby. But in case of patients who develop preeclampsia, uh, what has been seen in the histopathological examination of the placentas uh, at various 
uh, gestation of pregnancy that the patients who develop PIH later on have abnormal remodeling of these spiral arteries. The spiral arteries basically fail to develop into large, tortuous vascular channels, which are created by replacement of the normal uh, musculoelastic wall of the normal vessels. And in absence of these uh, large, uh, tortuous vascular channels, which provide good perfusion and oxygenation to the placenta and the fetus, uh, along with it, there is defective uh, trophoblast differentiation also, which doesn't allow the placenta and the placental vessels to penetrate inside the maternal myometrium and the endometrium, resulting in uh, continuous placental hypoperfusion, hypoxia, ischemia, and a shallow implantation. And all the sequelae which uh, uh, happens after this, which, uh, which uh, it will appear as uh, the... Uh, uh, preeclampsia, eclampsia, and HELP syndrome uh, going forward in the pregnancy. Risk factors, clinical risk factors for preeclampsia, uh, these are divided into high and moderate, but uh, basically patients with autoimmune diseases like SLE, APLA, chronic hypertension, diabetics, type 1, type 2, uh, history of preeclampsia in the previous pregnancies, multifetal gestations, pre-existing renal diseases, uh, have a high risk of developing PIH in their subsequent uh, uh, current and subsequent pregnancies. Uh, while even mothers who are 35 years or, or older, uh, black race, low socioeconomic status, a family history of preeclampsia, history of low birth weight infant, adverse pregnancy outcome, or more than 10 years gap between two pregnancies, Obesity, obese patients with a BMI more than 30 and nulliparity have also been seen to be associated with increased risk of preeclampsia. How do we manage a case of preeclampsia? So there are general principles. We have to treat the severe hypertension. We have to closely monitor uh, the status of mother as well as the fetus. Depending on which, we try and optimize the uh, time of delivery. Uh, we have to prevent eclampsia. And there has to be a continuous close monitoring of the mother and the fetus, which starts antepartum and which has to continue till the postpartum period. Uh, we all know that the definitive treatment of preeclampsia is delivery. As soon as we deliver the placenta, the, all the symptoms of PIH start resolving. Uh, although the timing of delivery is uh, based on the decision of uh, delivery is based on the gestational age the severity of preeclampsia and the maternal and fetal condition. Uh, so in a uh, case of very severe preeclampsia with all the symptoms, severe symptoms that we discussed before, uh, we should always uh, preemptively deliver the patient, uh, deliver the baby, because as soon as we deliver the placenta, the resolution starts. And uh, in our practice, uh, we all know that maternal health takes precedence, whatever be the gestational age of the fetus in case of uh, severe symptoms and if we see that there is a risk to life of the mother we have to deliver the patient but in cases where the pregnancy is between 24 to 34 weeks and the mother and the fetus are stable and they are being monitored in a center which has the specialization which has the consultants and which has the monitoring facility we can definitely go with an expected management of these few selected cases. Uh, in these cases, we should definitely give antenatal corticosteroids, a course of beta uh, which has to be administered whenever the clinician is uh, feels that the birth is impending in the next seven days. Even if we have a 48 hours window, we should always give this uh, for the uh, lung maturity of the baby. And the timing of the uh, delivery in these expectant cases should be uh, should uh, once the pregnancy has crossed the 37 week mark, we should uh, deliver the baby, uh, whether or not the cervix is favorable, whether or not the uh, uh, the uh, pr pregnancy progresses, uh, like gets induced naturally, or uh, we have to deliver whichever time we see that uh, the preeclampsia is progressing, uh, the symptoms are worsening, and uh, there is a risk to the mother or the baby. Intrapartum management. Uh, the route of birth, uh, uh, there is no clear-cut evidence that going for a caesarean section uh, gives any advantage in terms of maternal and fetal uh, outcomes. Uh, but we should not, uh, we should opt 
uh, for the root uh, of birth depending on the normal standard obstetric indication and anything which will delay the uh, delivery for more than 12 to 24 hours in the presence of symptoms of severe eclampsia should not be opted for. Intrapartum monitoring. Continuous maternal and fetal monitoring is indicated uh, to identify worsening hypertension, deteriorating maternal, hepatic, renal, cardiopulmonary, and neurological hepatic function, uh, presence of an abruption or abnormal fetal heart tracing. These are all desirable, but not absolutely mandatory. Uh, uh, even putting an arterial line or a CVP and all these procedures are not indicated. Fluids. Uh, 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 we should always, in a patient who has a history of preeclampsia, we should always avoid excessive fluid administration uh, due to the risk of development of pulmonary uh, edema. And there is significant third spacing in this uh, patient population, especially in those who have the severe end of disease spectrum. Uh, oliguria should always alarm you. If the oliguria is not responding to a, a modest fluid challenge of around 300 to 500 ml, then we should always uh, uh, suspect a renal insufficiency. And then our further fluid therapy should be guided as per the urine output. And uh, we should continuously monitor the uh, output as well as the uh, respiratory function uh, and watch for developing pulmonary edema. Management of hypertension. Uh, in case of uh, preeclampsia with severe uh, severe symptoms or severe preeclampsia, uh, we have uh, uh, these medicines which have been proven to be safe and uh, to be used in pregnant females. Uh, but our target, uh, our, the treatment has to be started uh, as soon as the blood pressure reaches 160 by 110. Uh, that is indicated so that we are preventing uh, any impending stroke uh, in the pregnant patient. But we should also note that antihypertensive therapy and controlling this blood pressure doesn't have any relation with prevention of eclampsia. That is a separate issue. Even if you control the blood pressure, there is a chance that patient may develop a seizure. Uh, so a uh, blood pressure more than 160, 110 should definitely be treated. Uh, the target goal uh, of a uh, blood pressure in these patients would be 140 80 we don't want any further lower blood pressure readings because of the risk of uh, fetal hypoperfusion uh, that is the reason why uh, antihypertensive therapy to control non severe hypertension is not indicated because in trials it has been shown that it does not uh, diminish any perinatal morbidity and mortality uh, the drugs which are used, uh, we all are familiar with labetalol. That is the drug of choice. Uh, uh, it has found to be very safe uh, in for the mother as well as the fetus. Uh, you can start with a 20 mg IV bolus. Uh, you, after the bolus, we continue monitoring the patient's blood pressure every 5 and 10 minutes. And if you feel that the blood pressure is uh, not coming down and we uh, till we reach our target uh, goal of less than 160 110 around 140 80 we can uh, repeat the doses of labetalol every 10 to 20 minutes of 40 mg or and we can go up to 80 mg the total maximum cumulative dose for a day is 300 mg and uh, we have to keep a close eye on the patient's heart rate and the blood pressure uh, uh, to avoid any bradycardia or hypotension uh, also, we can start most of the times what we do is to start after an initial bolus, we start a continuous infusion of uh, two milligram per minute, basically titrated as per the target uh, blood pressure that we are trying to achieve. Uh, so uh, labetalol is uh, what we use most of the times in the ICU and we get good result with that. Other choices uh, can be hydralazine. 5 milligram IV pushed over one to two minutes. And again, you have to be there at the bedside monitoring the patient continuously every five to 10 minutes. And you can repeat these doses uh, 20 minutes. You can uh, give five to uh, 10 mg every two minutes. You can uh, give up till a maximum of 20 to 30 mg. Uh, then nicardipine is also one of the options. Uh, it's also uh, the calcium channel blockers are also very uh, good in controlling the blood pressure in uh, pregnant patients. Nicardipine is available as an IV preparation. You can start at 5 milligram per hour. And uh, uh, this also gives good result. The target of the blood pressure control remains the same. 
nifedipine or oh, immediate release extend release these are available as oral tablets so till the time you don't have an iv uh, access this is also a good option uh, you can give 10 mg orally if you have an extended release tablet 30 mg and you again monitor the blood pressure very closely and you can repeat the doses uh, if uh, the target blood pressure is not achieved and if the oral doesn't give you a good result then you can definitely switch uh, you can uh, you should always secure an IV line and start with an IV preparation. Candidates of seizure pro uh, prophylaxis. So all patients who are uh, who present to you with preeclampsia with severe symptoms should receive seizure prophylaxis, although it's not indicated in patients with preeclampsia who don't have any severe features. Uh, but we should note here that seizure prophylaxis, uh, the medications given for seizure prophylaxis, only works uh, for seizure prevention they they do not affect the natural progression of the disease apart from uh, the development of seizures uh, this is a trial magnesium sulfate for prevention of eclampsia trial uh, which included 10,000 patients and uh, it studied and the results were that the frequency of eclampsia in patients with preeclampsia and severe symptoms was 0.8% in the group with magnesium sulfate prophylaxis as compared to 1.9% uh, in the group which did not receive the prophylaxis. Uh, the risk of abruption was also reduced by magnesium sulfate prophylaxis. And although not statistically significant, uh, magnesium sulfate prophylaxis also reduced the risk of maternal death in those who present uh, with or without severe features of preeclampsia as compared to those who did not receive the magnesium sulfate prophylaxis. Uh, so we will uh, discuss in more detail about Maxelf here. Uh, this is the same drug which we are going to use for seizure prophylaxis here and as well as in eclampsia. Mechanism for uh, anticonvulsant effect of magnesium sulfate, uh, the proposed uh, mechanism is uh, it has an NM, uh, effect on the NMDA receptors. It causes membrane stabilization in the central nervous system secondary to its actions as a non-specific calcium channel blocker, as well as decreasing the acetylcholine transmission in the motor nerve terminals. Also, it promotes vasodilatation of the constricted cerebral vessels by opposing calcium-dependent arterial vasospasm, thereby reducing cerebral barotrauma and uh, it, that prevents the disruption of the blood-brain barrier uh, caused by circulating small extracellular vesicles which are present in patients with preeclampsia. Uh, the contraindications are patients with severe myasthenia gravis and also we should be cautious while using in patients with pulmonary edema as well as renal dysfunction. Uh, the dose uh, what we mostly use in ICU is the IV regimen. Uh, where we, wherein we give a bolus dose of 6 gram, 4 to 6 gram, 10% solution IV over 15 to 20 minutes, which is the loading dose, and followed by a maintenance dose of uh, 2 gram per hour, uh, but it can be in the range of 1 to 2 gram per hour. This is the Zuspan regimen. We all use it in the ICU. Uh, it's more preferred than the IM regimen, uh, which is 5 gram of 50% uh, intramuscular in both the buttocks followed by five uh, gram im alternatively in each buttock every four hour the iv regimen is preferred more uh, because first of all the im regimen is more painful uh, there is a risk of development of uh, uh, abscess uh, but the more important reason is that the iv regimen helps you achieve the desired concentration the therapeutic concentration earlier and the risk of uh, uh, repeat uh, recurrent seizure is decreased significantly. And it's also very easy to use and very easy to learn. So a uh, 6 gram bolus and a 2 gram per hour of uh, maintenance infusion is what we generally use. But at some places, it can be 4 gram followed by a 1 gram per hour infusion. That is also acceptable. Dosing in renal sufficiency, magnesium sulfate, because it's primarily excreted by kidneys, uh, it will require some dosing uh, adjustment in patients who uh, have renal insufficiency. 
although the loading dose, uh, the standard loading dose doesn't change as the volume of distribution is the same, but the maintenance dose, uh, we have to modify it as per the patient's creatinine level. Uh, if the creatinine is between 1.1 to 2.5, we can go with a maintenance dose of one gram per hour. But in case creatinine is more than 2.5, we can omit the maintenance dose and uh, uh, in the case of patients with end stage uh, renal disease, we have to be very cautious while using uh, magnesium sulfate, and we have to judge it on the basis of the risk and benefit ratio. Also, while giving the maintenance doses, we have to continuously monitor the patient, uh, and the maintenance dose is only continued when uh, the patellar re uh, reflex is present. Uh, loss of reflex is the first manifestation of sy uh, sy symptomatic hypermagnesemia. Uh, the RR is more than 12 breaths per minute, and the urine output is more than 100 ml in the last four hours. Uh, it should be more than 25 to 50 ml per hour. Uh, the, the therapeutic range uh, is described as 4.8 to 8.4 milligram per deciliter, uh, but that's not a very clear cut number. Uh, we have seen um, uh, results and uh, retrospect retrospective studies have seen that even lower uh, uh, therapeutic levels, uh, lower than 4.8 also, have uh, provided good seizure prophylaxis to the patient. So these are not very strict numbers, and that is the reason why we don't frequently monitor patients for magnesium levels uh, who, uh, who are not at increased risk of uh, magne hypermagnesemia. So when uh, exactly we have to do the magnesium levels, if the patient, if a patient who is receiving magnesium sulfate, uh, despite of the prophylaxis has a seizure, then we have to check uh, the whether we are in the therapeutic range or not. In patients who uh, have renal insufficiency and in patients who develop uh, clinical signs and symptoms of magnesium toxicity, uh, what is uh, generally done is that you stop the uh, in case of severe symptoms you stop the maintenance dose in case you suspect uh, toxicity you have to decrease the dose uh, maintenance dose uh, you take a send a serum sample if the serum magnesium level comes out to be more than 9.6 uh, milligram per deciliter then we stop the infusion wait for uh, two or three hours then again repeat and once the level comes below 8.4 we uh, need to restart it and continue it till the 24 hours postpartum when the risk of the uh, repeat recurrent seizure comes down. So signs of uh, magnesium toxicity as per the concentration in the blood at around 8.5 to 12 mill milligram per deciliter, we uh, start seeing the loss of deep tendon reflexes. 12 to 16 milligram per deciliter, we uh, find respiratory depression, respiratory paralysis at uh, 18 milligram, you start seeing conduction uh, defects, cardiac conduction defect, and a patient who has it more than 30 milligram per deciliter may have a sudden cardiac arrest also. Uh, having said that, we have to be very cautious, but if the uh, regimen is used in the correct doses in the correct way, uh, re it rarely happens that the therapeutic the level uh, uh, crosses the therapeutic window antidote in case the toxicity happens and if it is life threatening um, it's a, there's a conduct, cardiac conduction defect or a sudden cardiac arrest then we have to administer the patient with 15 to 30 ml of 10% like 1.5 to 3 grams of uh, calcium gluconate over 2 to 5 minutes uh, patients who have uh, less severe uh, signs and symptoms of toxicity, you can administer one gram of calcium gluconate and then uh, repeat as and when required. Concomitant, concomitant uh, administration of frusamide also will increase the urinary excretion of magnesium and will help in the situation. Uh, an alternate uh, that we all know is calcium chloride, which is a more concentrated solution. So that also can be used. Uh, the maternal side effect of uh, Maxalf uh, uh, max self therapy they are uh, few and they occur rarely but we should know it a rapid infusion of max self uh, can cause diaphoresis flushing uh, uh, probably because of the peri peripheral vasodilatory action and there may be a drop in blood pressure nausea vomiting headache muscle weakness visual disturbances and palpitation have also been complained uh, by a few patients dyspnea and chest pain may be symptoms of pulmonary edema, which is a rare side effect, but we should keep that in mind. Uh, transient re reduction in the total and ionized uh, serum calcium concentration due to rapid suppression of the parathyroid hormone uh, 
Sometimes that presents as a symptomatic hypocalcemia, myoclonus, delirium. Uh, uh, then uh, in that case, we just have to stop the magnesium therapy. And uh, that in most of the times will restore the normal serum calcium levels. And uh, But if we uh, are in a situation where there are conduction, cardiac conduction defects, then we have to supplement calcium as we uh, saw earlier. Fetal and neonatal effects from magnesium sulfate. Uh, magnesium definitely crosses the placenta and the uh, concentration in the cord blood is same as the maternal concentration. Uh, so maternal therapy uh, while giving Maxilf definitely affects the fetal heart rate. It causes a transient bradycardia, but it has, uh, uh, in most of the cases, the variation is within the normal acceptable range. And most of the time that bradycardia uh, is not severe enough to cause, uh, uh, like, uh, 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 justify a uh, uh, earlier delivery, uh, considering it a uh, fetal uh, depression. Drug interaction. Uh, the major drug interaction that we have to keep in mind is with calcium channel blockers. Uh, magnesium sulfate can uh, cause a synergistic cardiac depression, but uh, it has uh, the risk is minimal and it has not been found uh, to be happening very frequently. Uh, another thing that we have to keep in mind is uh, magnesium sulfate along with opioids can cause uh, cardiopulmonary depression in postpartum patients. Duration of therapy, Maxilf therapy. Sorry. Uh, in uh, preeclampsia without severe symptoms, it can be safely discontinued after 12 hours. In patients uh, for whom, although preeclampsia without severe symptoms, we generally don't start unless there are any added risk factors. Uh, it is uh, majorly used in patients with preeclampsia with severe symptoms and eclampsia, where it has to be continued 24 to 48 hours postpartum. That also depends on the clinical judgment, uh, uh, depending on the risk of recurrent seizures. After that period, uh, the risk is uh, uh, low in any case. Uh, what one clinical thing that uh, you that guides you is uh, a brisk diuresis. If that is happening, if the patient has a very good urine output of around 100 ml uh, in two or three hours, then uh, you can uh, take it as a accurate clinical indicator that the preeclampsia or eclampsia is resolving, and you can safely stop it at 24 hours uh, postpartum. Preeclampsia prevention. A lot of medications have been tried for this uh, uh, preeclampsia, but uh, the most promising has been low dose aspirin. The rationale why uh, it's used is because preeclampsia has been seen to be associated with increased platelet turnover and increased platelet derived thromboxin and uh, thromboxin le levels, which uh, the aspirin takes care of. And uh, it's mostly used only in high risk cases like previous pregnancy with preeclampsia, especially early onset with adverse outcomes, diabetics, chronic hypertension, multifetal gestation, kidney disease, autoimmune di uh, uh, patients with autoimmune diseases with potential vascular complications like SLE and APLA. Uh, it's initiated early uh, in the uh, second trimester of the pregnancy when the pathogenesis of the preeclampsia is actually uh, that starts in the body around 11 to 14 weeks. Dose is typically between 75 to 150 mg, and the timing of discontinuation is uh, it's continued till 36 weeks, weeks of gestation or uh, when we are expecting the delivery within the next five to seven days. Eclampsia. Eclampsia refers to the occurrence of new onset generalized tonic clonic seizures or coma in a patient with eclampsia, including HELP syndrome or gestational hypertension. Uh, so any uh, patient at term uh, developing seizure is uh, basically just a second. Sorry. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, so eclampsia, uh, basically any seizure uh, present uh, occurring in a patient who's at term is eclampsia unless proven otherwise. Uh, pathogenesis of seizure is not yet clearly understood. What are the proposed theorems are? Uh, the hypertension uh, probably causes a breakdown of the autoregulatory system of the cerebral circulation, leading to hyperperfusion, endothelial dysfunction, resulting in a vasogenic anacytotoxic edema, resulting in a seizure, or the hypertension causing activation of the autoregulatory system, leading to vasoconstriction, hypoperfusion, localized ischemia, endothelial dis uh, dysfunction, resulting in a 
cytotoxic or vasogenic edema. Clinical presentation, if we see in most of the patient, uh, presentation is uh, same as the uh, patient with uh, preeclampsia and severe symptoms. They present with hypertension, having headaches, visual disturbances. Uh, some 25% of them may be having a right upper quadrant or epigastric pain. And some of them actually may be asymptomatic also. On uh, physical examination, you may find brisk DTRs, uh, visual perception defects, and uh, altered mentation, memory def deficits, or sometimes cranial nerve defects. Uh, Eclamptic seizures are uh, generally uh, are generalized tonic clonic seizure. The general principle of managements are the same. We have to watch for maternal and fetal safety. We have to prevent maternal hypoxia. We have to prevent. Uh, we have to maintain the the normal ABC that we do airway patency. We have to prevent as aspiration. Uh, take care of hypoxia and trauma. Then we have to treat, uh, treat the severe hypertension if that is present, which is present in most of the cases. Uh, we have to uh, terminate the seizure. We have to give seizure prophylaxis so that a recurrent seizure is prevented. And we have to evaluate the pre uh, patient uh, for prompt delivery. Anti-seizure medication, as we already read before, that Maxilf is the medication, anti-seizure medication of choice. and. Uh, uh, it is uh, based on a randomized trial which have demonstrated that it reduces the rate of recurrent seizures by about one, uh, about a half or a two third. And the rate of maternal death is also reduced by one third. A series of uh, reviews reported that magnesium sulfate was safer and more effective than phenytoin, diazepam, or uh, the uh, combination of uh, various other uh, anti-epileptics for prevention of recurrent seizures. Another advantage is that it's low cost, it's easily available, the administration is easy, and it doesn't have uh, any significant sedative effect on the patient as compared to the other anti-epileptic medications. Also, an additional benefit is that in utero expo exposure to magnesium sulfate therapy decreases the risk of cerebral palsy and severe motor dysfunction in offsprings born between the 32 to 34 uh, weeks of gestation. So we have already discussed about MagSelf, how to give, when not to give, uh, when to monitor the levels. Uh, but in case of eclampsia, when the patient has already having seizure, the tonic-clonic phase of the eclamptic seizure uh, is actually very brief when uh, the patient uh, initially uh, has the first seizure. Then at that time, you have to start the MagSelf therapy for the prophylaxis of the recurrent seizure. But what to be done if there is a patient who is seizing for more than five minutes, you have already started MagSelf and the, the seizure has not got terminated. Then uh, the other option is a lorazepam 4 MGIV, which uh, you can repeat uh, after every three to five minutes till the seizure con uh, gets under control. And if we, we don't have an IV access, which uh, by this time, ideally we should have, but if the drug availability is not there and we could not insert, then we can use a IM uh, med Medazolam 10 mg. That is also one of the options. But as early as possible, we should secure two IV lines for this patient because uh, as soon as we start with the maxel prophylaxis, the chances of recurrent seizures come down. Uh, uh, what? Uh, but there are situations where uh, the seizures are refractory to the MagSelf therapy or there may be uh, some uh, etiologies which are present apart from eclampsia uh, because of which we are not able to achieve a good control on the seizures. So in those cases, we can consider using phosphenetoin uh, or phenytoin 20 mg per kg IV uh, along with the cardiac monitoring. Fetal resuscitation. Fetal bradycardia uh, can happen because of the MagSelf or because of the seizure, which may last for a few minutes, but invariably it recovers. Uh, only in few cases where the uh, fetal heart tracings are not reassuring, even after 10 to 15 minutes, then we should think about, uh, we should uh, have a suspicion for some occult uh, abruption that might have happened. And then an emergency delivery may have to be considered. Uh, duration of MagSelf therapy we have seen is around 24 to 48 hours, but that should depend on the uh, clinical judgment of the clinician. So this is the treatment algorithm. Uh, we have to give supportive 
care, put the patient in the uh, in a patient with eclampsia. You have to put the patient in the left lateral position, take care of the airway, give supplemental oxygen, and uh, establish the IV axis, control the hypertension. If the seizure doesn't resolve in five minutes, then you can uh, give an ad additional dose of lorazepam, IV, or midazolam I IM. And uh, if the seizure still doesn't resolve, then uh, the patient may be having status epilepticus. And then we have to further uh, plan for neuroimaging and uh, consult the neurologist and uh, plan out the treatment. But in majority of the cases, uh, by the, this time, even with the initial, after the initial uh, seizure, if we have started with the myxel therapy, there is uh, most of the times there will be uh, the seizure will subside in some cases. Uh, so at that point, we we should just start the regimen, uh, what, whichever IV I am uh, is preferred at your center. Uh, you can load the patient with four to six gram and then start with a maintenance to, uh, infusion of one to two gram. But if there is a recurrence of the seizure, then please check the magnesium level. We you can uh, again give a bolus of four gram and uh, continue the maintenance infusion at a higher dose of three gram. In uh, cases where there is no pulmonary edema, there are no signs of magnesium toxicity, and the renal dysfunction was uh, there was no renal dysfunction to begin with, and uh, in case the seizure still uh, uh, recurs, then we have to stop myxelf and switch to phenytoin, uh, and uh, at the dose of 20 mg per kg IV that we have uh, uh, already discussed, and we have to go for an urgent uh, neuro consult and get the neuro imaging done and rule out the other differentials. Help syndrome. Uh, this is a syndrome. Uh, HELP stand for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet count. Uh, this occurs in pregnant and postpartum individuals and is characterized by hemolysis with a microangiopathic blood smear, elevated liver enzymes, and a low platelet count. Pathogenesis uh, is basically sim similar to preeclampsia. Uh, it's just that patients who go on and develop health have a greater hepatic involvement, more inflammation in the liver, and a greater activation of the coagulation system. Uh, some people believe that health is actually a separate disorder uh, because in uh, around 20% of the patient uh, with help and they do not have features of severe hypertension and proteinuria so we don't we're not very clear about the pathogenesis but the management principles remain the same uh, patient presentation uh, may patient present with proteinuria malaise uh, hypertension, right upper quadrant, epigastric pain, nausea, vomiting, headache, visual disturbances, jaundice. But some of the patients may actually uh, present with serious maternal mor morbidity at the outset or uh, may deteriorate shortly thereafter. Uh, this includes placental abruption, AKI, pulmonary edema, subcapsular or intraparenchymal liver hematomas, and ret retinal detachment. DIC is also a feature that you see in some of the patients, but usually it is associated with abruption, uh, severe peripartum bleeding, and fulminant hepatic failure. Gestational age uh, is, again, late pregnancy between 20 to 37 weeks of gestation. But onset in late second trimester or even postpartum uh, is also common. Uh, here, uh, we have seen that uh, in eclampsia, in severe preeclampsia, that the delivery of the fetus uh, is a definitive treatment. But why some patients go on uh, to develop seizures postpartum or have uh, features of preeclampsia after that, even after uh, delivery of uh, placenta, is still not very well understood. And that's why uh, we are still trying to understand the pathogenesis in more detail. And definitely, there are more uh, immunological, inflammatory, and uh, genetic factors which contribute to the uh, pathogenesis of all the spectrum of diseases which are yet to be understood. Uh, diagnostic evaluation of help, you have to send a peripheral smear, a CBC, liver function, renal function test, and a serum haptoglobin and LDH along with coagulation studies. The laboratory, uh, uh, the diagnosis based on uh, these laboratory values, we have to establish hemolysis uh, by at least two of the following findings, peripheral smear, uh, showing schistocytes and bar cells, serum bilirubin more than 1.2, low serum haptoglobin less than 25 milligram per deciliter, or an LDH more than two times of the upper normal value, severe anemia unrelated to any blood loss. 
elevated liver enzyme AST and LT, ALT more than two times of normal and a low platelet count less than one lakh. There is further subclassification uh, which has been uh, there in like theoretically as based on the platelet count, but it's not very commonly used. Management of health is again on very similar principle as preeclampsia and eclampsia. You have to diagnose it uh, after seeing the patient's clinical condition, gestation, uh, the lab reports, uh, administer the uh, seizure prophylaxis, treat the severe hypertension, and then look at the gestational age. If it is more than 34 weeks, then better to deliver the patient after maternal stabilization. If uh, there are any uh, risk factors like uh, non-reassuring fetal testing, uh, fetal death, abrupt placenta, pulmonary edema, eclampsia, uh, hepatic bleeding, stroke, AKI, DIC, then we have to deliver the patient uh, because the maternal uh, health takes precedence. If none of these uh, severe symptoms are present and the gestation is less than 34, then we can go uh, with an expectant uh, management with a very, very close monitoring. And uh, uh, during this window, we can uh, you give the uh, de uh, dexamethasone, beta methasone dose and then uh, deliver as soon as uh, the symptoms get severe or the fetal maturity is attained. Uh, there, there will be a few patients in this subgroup who will have severe right upper quadrant epigastric pain, which uh, is because of the hepatic bleeding or hepatic swelling, uh, which is because of the liver rupture. In these cases, with severe abdominal pain, we should uh, assess the patient with a, uh, ultrasonography. That is a good initial study. And eventually, we may need a CT and MRI as per the patient's condition. The hematoma may re remain contained within the liver capsule, or it may rupture uh, with resulting hemorrhage into the peritoneal cavity. It's a life-threatening complication, both for the mother and the fetus. And uh, early diagnosis, early treatment management is uh, has to be instituted. So you have to hemodynamically stabilize the patient in this situation, uh, correct the coagulopathy uh, and the severe anemia, and uh, immediately go for a prompt delivery. Uh, role of therapeutic plasma exchange, it has uh, shown to be having no benefit in health. It's not indicated in health. It's the mainstay of treatment in TTP, which is one of the differentials. But in case of a patient having a HELP syndrome, there is no role of steroids, neither uh, is there a role of plasma exchange. Uh, so uh, when we uh, have a patient who is having a hemolytic, hemolytic picture in the uh, blood smear, who is having thrombocytopenia, who is having liver and renal involvement, there are a few differentials which uh, will definitely come to our mind. Uh, so this is a good table which uh, tells you how uh, the frequency of the symptoms are a little different and uh, these are all very close differentials. So we have to go clinically as well as uh, laboratory findings and uh, like HELP syndrome, uh, you will see it's more associated with uh, preeclampsia and eclampsia, hypertension, proteinuria is uh, very, uh, is, it happens in most of the patients, but fever is not there. And the liver involvement, uh, the jaundice, uh, it, it may not be severe in all the patients. Uh, and the CNS involvement is also in around 50% patient as compared to uh, AFLP, uh, which uh, it, where the uh, presentation, it can mimic HELP syndrome very closely. Uh, but that uh, uh, HELP uh, and preeclampsia, they uh, appear in the patient uh, in closer to the term more than 20 weeks but closer to 28 weeks but aflp can actually set in in the second uh, uh, second trimester also it has more profound liver involvement very severe hypoglycemia very deranged lfts and some of the patient will present with fever also uh, uh vis a vis help syndrome uh, there is also a uh, 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 mention in the literature where serum fibrinogen is very useful in distinguishing AFLP from HELP. Uh, a serum fibrinogen level of less than 300 milligram uh, per deciliter is uh, more diagnostic of AFLP. You'll re rarely find these values in HELP syndrome and preeclampsia unless there is a complicating DIC or a abruption. So uh, that's about AFLP. TTP, you will see that the hypertension uh, will be less common. It, it is variable, actually, but uh, it may not be that profound. 
and uh, then uh, the liver involvement is rare cns involvement is more profound it has earlier uh, onset the thrombocytopenia the rate of decline of uh, thrombocytopenia is much more so we have to monitor everything in hus also uh, there will be a more prominent uh, renal involvement and these patients after the delivery help and preeclampsia most of the cases they will resolve but the ttp and hus will not get resolved hus patient most of the times will go on receive two or three sessions of dialysis before uh, if at all they start improving and sle also mimics and uh, in patients who are having pre-existing autoimmune uh, diseases uh, it can mimic uh, preeclampsia it may get worsened and it sometimes we find it difficult uh, but uh, we can take help of the nephrologist also here uh, there are subtle differences in the peripheral smear more hemolysis seen in uh, sle um, and more uh, involvement of the kidneys. So uh, we have to take care of all these things. We have to rule out, make a diagnosis. It's important because in some cases like TTP, where Plex is the uh, mainstay of therapy, uh, unlike health, we have to make an early diagnosis. And uh, these differentials are very important. Also in patients who, who have the occurrence of preeclampsia or eclampsia less than 20 weeks, which is not very normal, uh, you should suspect a molar pregnancy in patients with persistent neuro uh, neurological defects uh, uh, even after uh, the seizure has subsided and the 24 to 48 hours window has uh, uh, crossed uh, that suggests that there may be some uh, near, uh, some uh, uh, anatomical defect of the cns like or some stroke or intracranial hemorrhage a, a brain mass lesion or some kind of a uh, uh, TTP or uh, CNS infection, which may be complicating uh, the uh, and superimposed along with the preeclampsia and uh, eclampsia. Seizures uh, without neurological defects may be triggered by metabolic abnormalities. We all know. Uh, so, in a patient who has a seizure, although uh, eclampsia is our uh, is at the top of the differential, but we should try to rule out uh, these uh, metabolic abnormalities wherever uh, uh, you feel uh, they, they are indicated. And pregnancy is a precipitating factor for some of the disorders which may be associated with seizure, like a TTP and HUS. So we should also uh, keep those things in mind. The other uh, uh, type of hypertension, gestational hypertension, uh, new onset of uh, systolic blood pressure more than 140-90 without any proteinuria and without any uh, sign and symptoms of end organ damage. Uh, this is a separate entity because it is a milder form, but most of the patients will cross over and may and may develop preeclampsia or and uh, help and have seizures. So we have to closely monitor it and uh, uh, the control of the blood pressure, the principles and all uh, apply in a very similar fashion. All the medication that we have already discussed are to be used here. Chronic hypertension with or without superimposed uh, preeclampsia. Uh, chronic hypertension is uh, pre uh, present before pregnancy or at least at two occasions before the 20 weeks of gestation. And uh, hypertension that is first diagnosed during pregnancy and persists for at least 12 weeks post delivery or is also considered under uh, chronic hypertension and chronic hypertension along with the uh, uh, superimposed preeclampsia uh, these patients will have a sudden increase in blood pressure that was previously well controlled or will require an escalation of antihypertensive therapy they may have a new onset proteinuria sudden increase in the pre-existing proteinuria or a significant new uh, end organ dysfunction uh, after the 20th week of gestation. So to conclude, I would just, uh, uh, this is a small uh, table that shows us how they are very, uh, the distinction is very uh, small, but you can see that uh, preeclampsia help and uh, uh, gestational hypertension, uh, patients will be normotensive uh, to begin with, and they will go on and develop hypertension and proteinuria and thrombocytopenia. Uh, the spectrum and the involvement of the different organs and the uh, uh, the presentation will be minorly different but we have to make uh, uh, this these distinctions so that we know what the patients are at risk and we can manage them appropriately thank you uh, any comments any questions thanks nidhi for the talk um, just one one thing on the nifedipine part right 
um in while we were in training i think one of the things that happened is i think a na- report came out from jama and uh, i think it was published in the nature as well where uh, immediate release sublingual uh, nifedipine was shown to uh, exacerbate the risk of uh, cvas or uh, complications in patients with hypertensive emergencies and also in preeclampsia so i think uh, there was a report on that people still use it but there is a safety question mark on it so i don't know if that is still part of the guidelines or have they taken it off i don't think it's a preferred agent anymore yeah definitely it's not preferred but uh, that part of the talk i have taken it from up to date so it, since it's still being used in the peripheries and uh, like the drugs iv drugs are not available very freely uh, but yeah definitely labetalol is the drug of choice and uh, if we can use that in the correct doses that is the best option okay i think there are no questions so uh, yeah we'll stop the talk here it's already 925 thanks all of you for joining thank you so much